here and you're gonna start, this is yours. Okay, well, thank you very much for the nice introduction and, and thanks also to the organizer for giving me the opportunity to present uh, the work that we do at TICFO uh, uh, in this very nice, very nice workshop. So yes, yeah, so I, will, I will talk about um, quantum repeaters and how to make quantum nodes for quantum repeaters and how to try to link them and to create entanglement with them. So of course the, the, the idea, the long-term goal of, of all this, this research project will be to create a, a, a global quantum network where you would have, uh, you know, be, where we will be able to distribute uh, entanglement over, over very large distances uh, between any two points, let's say on, 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 on the continent. So, just use the laser pointer. No, not this one. This one. Okay. So this kind of of of, um, of quantum network would would look uh, something like this. So you have you would have quantum nodes, which would be typical typically material systems, where you can store and and process quantum information. And between these nodes, you would have uh, quantum channels where you would send photons to, to distribute quantum information and entanglement between them. And if we could do that, um, um, you know, we could do a lot of um, different applications. Of course, the most known application would be to do uh, secure communication using QKD. Um, but there are also other type of application that, you, that we could think about, uh, for example, to, co to, 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 to connect quantum computers, to do secure cloud quantum computing, or other some maybe less well-known applications to, to make for example, telescope arrays or, or clock synchronization, um, improve clock synchronization. So I guess you will hear a bit more about these kind of applications in, in the talk of uh, Stephanie Venner, which is I think on, on, on Thursday. So let's imagine now that we want to distribute entanglement between two of these nodes. So let's focus on, on, on two of these, of these distant nodes and we try to distribute now entanglement or or at least distribute a quantum bit between them. It turns out that if, uh, you know, we would like to typically use photons uh, for, for, for distributing, for sending the information, but it turns out that it's not so easy to just use photons because uh, if we do this and we send photons, for example, in, in optical fiber, there are a lot of loss in, in the fiber, even if we use photon at telecom wavelength, and, the, and so the photon will be absorbed after a few hundred kilometers and we cannot no longer distribute information. So what we can use instead is a, is a quantum repeater architecture and in this architecture you will basically divide the total links into 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 several sublinks uh, that we will call uh, uh, elementary links and and you will distribute now entanglement within each of these elementary link in an independent way and when all of the links succeed uh, when in that case these two links succeed then you will do a bell state measurement in, in this with these two nodes here in the middle which will by ex entanglement swapping extend the entanglement towards the outer outer nodes. And um, of course, here I depict only two nodes, but two, two links, but there could be in principle more, more, more links. So um, for this to work to succeed, we need, we need different things. First of all, we need to be able to create entanglement in a heralded fashion. So we need to know when an, an entanglement is distributed into an elementary link. And then we also need to, uh, uh, when we know that the entanglement is successfully distributed, we also need to store this entanglement into some, some quantum memories to wait for the other parts of the network to also be, also be ready. So in this talk, I will uh, first uh, tell you about how we can build one of these uh, quantum repeater nodes. Uh, and then I will tell you about an experiment that we recently did uh, to create now uh, entanglement, heralded entanglement between uh, distant um, multiplex solid state quantum memories. And then towards the end of the talk, I will tell you about an, another experiment that we are currently pursuing to, um, to try to generate now um, memory compatible uh, on-demand single photons uh, with, with uh, collective readback excitations in cold, cold atomic ensemble. Okay. For quantum node, what do, what do we need? So the first thing that we would need for this quantum node is to be able to interact efficiently with light. So we would like to be able to create entanglement efficiently between photons and, and the matter qubits. And the photons ideally should be at telecom wavelengths because we want to send them over long distance into optical fiber. Uh, we would like the node to, to be long lived, meaning that we would like to keep the coherence in the node for, for very long times. And ideally also we would like to, this node to be able to not only to store one qubit, but many qubits. So you would like to, to do some kind of multiplexing 
uh, to have a sort of multi-qubit register in this in this quantum. And ideally, another uh, uh, capability that you that you might need is to be able to do quantum logic now between between these these uh, these local qubits, for example, to perform a deterministic bell state measurement. So there have there are several candidates that have been uh, considered for 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 quantum nodes. Um, I list here a few, it's a non-exhaustive list. So there are yeah, cold atomic and hot atomic ensembles or dark crystals, single atoms, single uh, trapped ions or, or color centers. Um, but typically this, all these candidates can be divided into two big uh, families. Uh, the first one of this family is based on ensembles of collection of atoms. And, and, and this would be the case for the atomic ensemble and the red crystals here, for example. Um, and there, the, the, the nice thing is that you can have an easy uh, light matter interaction and strong light matter interaction, let's say, uh, without an optical cavity. And this is because just you have, you have many, many ions, many, or many atoms in your system, so you can easily absorb, absorb light. Um, and the qubits are stored in the form of collective uh, atomic excitations, so uh, and quantum objects of, of this form here. Well, you have one excitation which is distributed over all the atoms in, in your system. And this, this kind of quantum object is actually very nice because uh, it will allow you then to uh, generate a single photon to retrieve the, the, the matter excitation into a single photon with a very high probability thanks to uh, a collective uh, interference between all the images. And finally, a last advantage, last great advantage of, of atomic ensembles is that you, because you have many atoms, you can also store uh, in principle many, uh, many modes, many, many qubits. And so we can use them to, to make uh, multiplexing of quantum information. Uh, the single emitters, on the other hand, uh, they have one uh, very uh, good, nice advantage that uh, you can, in principle, have strong interaction between the, between qubits, which which enables quantum logic, and also you can um, more easily, I would say, than, than in ensembles, create uh, on-demand uh, light matter and entanglement. Uh, it will never be deterministic, but at least with, with in principle some high uh, high efficiency. But for this, uh, you need to have a cavity, and this cavity needs to be actually quite high uh, finesse, which sometimes complicates a bit the, the, the experiment. So we might wonder whether it's possible to, to achieve also this feature in an ensemble-based approach to have quantum logic and, and on-demand uh, um, uh, generation of quantum light with an ensemble-based approach. And the answer is yes. Uh, and we can use, uh, actually we can use uh, collective Rydberg excitations in, in, in cold atomic ensembles, and I will tell you about this uh, towards the end of, of the talk. Okay, let's uh, now look at how we can make create entanglement between between uh, these uh, these distant nodes. Um, so there, there have there are several proposals. Uh, one proposal is to to uh, is depicted here. The idea is that you would have um, two photon pair sources uh, at each node, at node A and node B. And one of the photon, you store it in the, into a quantum memory. And the other photon, you send it into an optical fiber. Uh, and now you will pump these two sources uh, uh, coherently, such that you generate a photon pair in, in superposition of the two sources. And then these two photons now that go into the optical fibers, you will combine them at a central location uh, of the bin splitter here. And then you will wait for having a click in one of the detectors. And if you have a click in the detector uh, uh, after this bin splitter, this will actually, the bin splitter will erase the information about the origin of the photon. And if you have a click, you don't know if this photon came from the left or from the right. And what you will have is an actually an entangled state where you have collective excitation stored in this memory on, on, on memory A and no excitation on, on, in B. And Coherence superposition with with the other way around, and uh, if we want this, if you want this entanglement to, to succeed, uh, you, you have to to keep this phase here constant. So you have you have to control the phase uh, of the in the propagation of the photons toward the bin splitter at, at the center. So this is a uh, it's an entangled state. We create an entangled state. It's heralded, right? We have a click here that tells us, okay, now you are you have an entangled state, and and the two memories can in principle be uh, be, be be far away. So this is actually very similar at the scheme that um, one looking Sirac and Zoller proposed in 2001. 
and which was also demonstrated with, with, with coal atoms in the group of, of Kimball and, and, and John Wayne Pans more recently. Um, but it has the, the specific advantage that you can optimize the wavelength. So this source here can have can create two photons with different wavelengths, one which is compatible with your quantum memory, and one which could be telecom wavelengths to be sent over long distance in optical fiber. And also then you can take advantage of, of as we will see later, of, of the fact that some of the memories uh, that, that we will use will be temp naturally temporarily uh, multiplexed. So why does multiplexing help? So Let's imagine and let's remind us that we need to have heralded um, uh, entanglement. So this means that if you, you have a memory that can store only uh, uh, one single mode, you would need to try uh, to generate these this photons. The photon needs to travel uh, to the central bin splitter. And then you have the information about if you had a click or not, how to travel back to the original node before you can try again, let's say. So you have a waiting time uh, of L0 over C between two successive trials. And if now that these two memories, for example, are far away, uh, say 100 kilometers, this waiting time is actually quite long, it's 500 microseconds. And so this means that a particular uh, repeater working on this principle would, would have a repetition rate of only two kilohertz. And this is combined now to the fact that for each trial, the success probability is also quite low because you need to generate a photon and to transmit a photon and to detect it. And so the overall rate of, uh, of success rate of such an elementary link would actually be very low over a long distance. But now imagine that you can uh, have memories that store not only one mode, not only one qubit, but, but many. Uh, in that case, you could repeat many times during the communication time. So you could repeat n times. And this to, to first order will basically increase your probability to, 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 to get a successful event by a factor of n. And so you will, um, at the end, increase your rate of entanglement by a factor of n. And n, in principle, uh, could actually be quite, quite large. And we will see that, uh, in principle, it could be at least larger than 1,000 and, and possibly even, even higher. So what do we need if we want to do such an experiment? Um, we first, uh, one first requirement is that we need to have a storage time in the memory uh, much longer than, than, than L0 over C. And this is because we would like that, you know, when we have the click of, of, of the heralding, that we would like to still have the entanglement stored in the memory. If the memory time is shorter than when we have a click, the entanglement would have gone already, and then we cannot use it for further, uh, for, for further operations. Uh, we need to have photon pair sources with, you know, compatible with one mode compatible with the quantum memory, the other mode compatible with telecom. Uh, we need to store, uh, to have a multi-mode memory to store n modes, and this could be in time, but it could also be in, in frequency and in, in space. Um, and you need to be able to read out these modes now uh, um, independently and selectively. And of course, you need also to preserve the phase of, of all these modes. Okay, so let's, let's now uh, see how we can um, create now, generate entanglement between two, two solid state quantum, uh, quantum memories. First, first of all, let me introduce uh, the, the system that, that we use. Um, so we, we use a, a, a rare earth uh, doped crystal, uh, in particular, a prosodymium doped crystal. And this is a system which is very nice because it has a large number of, of stationary atoms with optical and spin transitions. So here we don't need to, to trap the atom, they are naturally trapped in, in the solid. Um, and so we, we have, we have a spin transition. In that case, we have three uh, hyperfine spin states and three hyperfine excited states and coupled by an optical transition at 606 nanometer. And the coherence properties of this system is actually quite good. Um, if you cool them down to, uh, let's say, less than four Kelvin, sorry, the cryostat. So with prosodymium, we have typically a spin T2 of uh, coherence time of about one second if we use uh, a suitable magnetic field and an optical T2 of around 150 microseconds. And this material, we like it. It's nice because uh, it has a nice structure to, to store information for a long time in the spin states. And actually people have been able to store light, classical light for up to one minute in this crystal. Uh, people have also demonstrated that you can store, um, um, let's say a weak coherent states with very high efficiency up to seven, almost 70% in this crystal. 
Um, however, it has a small drawback is that the bandwidth of the memory is quite limited and actually it's limited by the spacing between these this, this, this states here. So the bandwidth is, the buffer memory is limited to around four megahertz, uh, which means that it will be actually quite challenging to create a quantum state of light resonant with this memory. And it will also be challenging to filter out the noise um, that when we will do the, 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 the quantum memory. I'll tell you about this later. So um, something else that I want to, 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 to emphasize is that this, uh, this crystal have, you know, in homogeneous broadening, we are in the solid state. So each ion has a slightly different um, resonance frequency. But the nice point is that this thing homogeneous broadening can be tailored. And we will see that it is, uh, how we can use that to, to now uh, uh, use it as a resource for, for, for multiplexing. And also we can actually use uh, uh, this design to make integrated quantum memories because it's a solid state design. So we can in principle uh, do integrated quantum memories and we have done some experiments towards this as well. So um, let's see now how we can store information in this, in this system. So let's imagine now that we have a two level system to start with, and it is inhomogeneous, inhomogeneously broadened as, I, as I, I mentioned before. So now if we send a single photon in this, what we will create is a collective uh, optical excitation uh, with one atom excited, but the excitation is distributed among all the atoms. But now because of the uh, uh, inhomogeneous broadening, this excitation will basically decay um, and, and deface, and then the photon will be basically lost. So to counteract this defacing, what we can do is to, to make what we call an atomic frequency comb, and which is um, you know, a periodic uh, and, and, and structure of absorption peaks with very narrow absorption peaks. And then if we have a, such a structure, after some time, uh, which uh, one over delta, we will have periodic rephasing with time one over delta, let's say. And if we do things well, after the first rephasing, most of the light can come back, can be re-emitted. And, and, and then we will have this collective uh, re-emission of, of, of the light in the forward mode. So the, this protocol is actually very nice because if you now come with a train of single photons, what you will have at the output is also a train of single photons. So it's inherently temporarily uh, multi-mode. But this, this protocol up to now is, is what we call a fixed storage time quantum memory. So the, the photon is stored for a time one over delta. Um, um, but this one over delta is, is predetermined before, before you store the photon. So if you want to have, let's say, an on-demand readout, uh, what, what, you can, what you can do is while this photon is stored into the memory, you send a control pulse to now bring it down to the, to, the, to the spin state. And so now you transfer a collective optical excitation into a collective spin excitation. And then you store it for some, for some time. And then you can read it out now on demand by sending a second control pulse. And then the photon will, will come back now on this transition. So this allows you to, to have on demand uh, readouts um, and also to, to take advantage of the longer storage time. So in principle, now you can store. Uh, you can store uh, light for for a very long time in, in this in this spin state. And this first measurement have, have been done uh, at a single photon level has been done actually at TICFO and, and and also together in Geneva. And this is the challenge that I was telling you about is because this control pulse here are very close in frequency to the single photon, and so it's actually hard to 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 be able to to remove all the noise created by by these by these frequencies by these control pulses. Okay, now we have a memory. Let's see how we can now generate a, a source, uh, how we can make a source for, for quantum light. So the idea is that we use a spontaneous parametric down conversion uh, in a cavity. And what we would like to have is a widely non-degenerate source with one photon around 606 nanometer resonant with the memory and the other photon at telecom. And so for this, we pump the source in, in the room. And, and because it's in a cavity, we can have a very narrow band uh, spectrum of around two megahertz for, 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 for the biphoton. And also, because it's in a cavity, the probability to generate a photon in the cavity mode will be enhanced uh, by a factor of, of around uh, F square, where F is the finesse. And th this is now um, um, the finesse in this in our realization is about 150. And the free spectral range 260 megahertz. So if we look a bit more detail about the spectrum that we, that we generate, 
uh, we can see actually that you know we are in a cavity, so we have many longitudinal modes. Uh, but because the two wavelengths have slightly different free spectral ranges, um, at the end, the, the, the global spectrum that we will generate is something like this, where we have typically 15 uh, uh, spectral modes separated by uh, the free spectral range, 260 megahertz. Um, um, and with a line width each mode of about 1.8, 1.8 megahertz. So typically, uh, for most of the experiment we do, we um, select a single mode by a spectral filter. Um, but as we will see, this is not, uh, we don't have to do this. And we can also, in principle, take advantage of all, all the modes that we will also see later. So first experiment that we can do is to um, now take the, the quantum light out of the source. Uh, we have a dichroic mirror, so the telecom photon is transmitted and we detect it. And then this will arrive now a single photon in the, in the mode at 606 nanometer. And then we will uh, basically uh, look at the cross correlation, for example, between these two detectors, install the signal while after the, the, the signal photon has been stored and retrieved from the memory. And this is what you see here on the left. This is the second order cross correlation function. Uh, which you see at a function of pump power. And you see when we increase the pump power of the source of, of this pump laser here, um, this cross correlation decreases. And this is very typical from a down conversion source where we increase the pump power and generate more and more pairs. And then the, the cross correlation de decreases uh, as, as, as one over the one over P, typically one over the pump power. But nevertheless, if we decrease the pump power, we can reach actually quite high uh, cross correlation. And we can also generate now heralded single photons. You can see here measurement on the right. This is the source only. And when you decrease now the pump power, you can um, look at heralded autocorrelation function from this single photon, which are around 1.6, 10 to the minus 2, which is, which is reasonably good. So now, we, before we can store, in the, I showed that we can store light in excited state, but we can also, in principle, store it in, in, in the spin wave. So again, we have, our, we have our, our source here. So this is what we show here is uh, the, the AFC echo in the excited state. But now if we put control pulses uh, now on this transition here, we will now transfer the, the single photon or single excitation to, uh, to a spin state. And so what we have, he what we have here is a, a spin wave, is a spin echo. Um, um, an echo from the spin wave, let's say spin wave storage. And we can also show that we have non-classical correlation now um, between the tele this telecom photon and the photon that has been stored as a spin wave um, and, 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 and retrieved. Um, but as you can see here, the, the cross correlation here was about six. So this is much lower than, than, than an excited state. And the reason is that we have a bit of noise, which is generated by, by, these, by these control types. And, um, uh, but nevertheless, we could still demonstrate uh, you know, quantum correlation between the, the telecom photon and, and the spin wave. And this gives us now a prospect for, for ultra long storage time in, in, um, in space. So we have done recently some uh, improvement on that experiment uh, in terms of, of noise, in terms of uh, uh, cross correlation, and, and, and how we, and also we now are able to generate entanglement, not only uh, uh, non classical correlation. And, uh, you will see a talk by uh, by my student Yelena on Thursday at, at, at 6 p.m. Uh, regarding regarding this. Okay, so now um, let's see how we can finally uh, go to the entanglement experiment. So we have again our our our, our photon pair source, a cavity that we pump with a blue laser, and that we stabilize with this orange laser here, and. One of the photons is stored into a memory and the other is going into a single mode optical fiber. So the first thing we need to do is to double the setup, uh, which, uh, which we did. It's not completely trivial, but we, we, uh, we need to double, double the setup and make now try to make indistinguishable photons between these two, uh, these two, these two setup. And now uh, uh, these two quantum memories now are in two different uh, laboratories and separated by 10 meters. Um, um, and uh, in principle, they could be they could be they could be further away. So, to create the entanglement, what we do now is that we combine these two modes uh, at telecom wavelength. We combine them at the beam splitter, and then we will detect um, 
clicks at the, at the outputs of this build filter here. And if we have a click, then we, we see that we will, in principle, project the two, uh, the two memories into a state like this, one zero uh, plus zero one. So a state where you have one collective excitation shared between these two crystals um, 10 meters away in different laboratories. So again, here there is uh, this phase that I told you about uh, before. And so to control this phase, what we do is that we, we have a phase controller in the form of a fiber stretcher. And, and, and then we can, we can uh, basically control, control this phase um, in, in this interferometer. So how do we now check that we have entanglement? So of course, in principle, we should have these states, right? But you know, in practice, we have to, co to control, to check that we obtain really this, this state. So the idea, which was actually proposed by Stephen Van Enck in this paper here, um, is to, to make a quantum tomography experiment. So we want to build uh, basically uh, the density matrix of, of, of this experiment. So we want to uh, um, um, measure and, and, and compute these P's here, PIJ, which is the, the population, um, the conditional probability based on a heralding uh, to have uh, photons, uh, let's say, in, in, in the mode A and, and B respectively. So for example, P01, would be the, the probability to have a photon uh, zero in memory A and one in memory B, and, and so on. And, and D now would be the coherence between these, uh, these, these, these two. So you would need to measure some kind of interference fringe uh, with a visibility V, and then you can compute the, the, the D in this way. And if you can do that, then you can, you can calculate the concurrence uh, of this density matrix. And if this concurrence is uh, larger than zero, then you have entanglement. Uh, in principle, the maximum concurrence should be uh, should be one, but as long as it is larger than zero, you have entanglement. And so, the conditions to to get entanglement is actually quite a stringent uh, um, uh, threshold here. So we need to have a, a visibility quite high of order of one. It doesn't need to be one, but it needs to be reasonably high. And you need to be in the single excitation regime. So you need to, when you, once you have a click, you need to make sure that you have at most one excitation stored in this, these two memories here. And this, we calculate this, we measure this by the so-called single photon purity, which is this P11 divided by P10, P01. And this has to be much smaller than, than, than one in principle. So how, how do we measure this? Um, the diagonal elements, we will just actually put photon detectors at the output of the two memories and measure the photon emitted by the two quantum memories. And now for the coherence, we will actually recombine uh, these, these two modes uh, to, to, to check that we have a coherent superposition and condition again on, on heralding. Uh, we uh, will now uh, try to, to, to look at, at this, uh, the, 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 the clicks on one of these detectors as a function of, of this phase. Okay, here are the results. So let's, we start by actually measuring the, the, the P11 and in that, the, the, let's say the, the single photon purity. And in that case, we measure HC of 3.6, 10 to the minus two, which means that condition on a herald, the probability to have two excitations is, is, is less than 4%. And then we look whether we really have a coherent superposition into, into these two um, ensembles. And indeed, we can see that we have a nice interference fringe uh, with a visibility of around 84%. And with this, we can reconstruct the density matrix um, and we can compute the concurrence. And we see that with this data, the concurrence is around 10 to the minus two, uh, which is not so large, but it's definitely uh, larger, uh, sorry, it's definitely, definitely larger than, than, than zero. So this means that we do have entanglement in the system we do create a state with uh, one single collective excitation shared between now these two crystals, which are, which are 10 meters away. So what, what we see actually, the reason why this, this, this concurrence is very small is that because we have a very large um, vacuum component in, in this state. And the vacuum component is there for, for mainly two reasons. First of all, we lose a lot of photons from the memory to the detector. And so if we compensate for this uh, um, and, and we look at the concurrence now in the crystal, we gain more or less a factor of 10. So we have now um, around 10 to minus one uh, concurrence in, in the crystal. 
and the rest of, of, of the concurrence is due to the fact that we don't have perfect visibility and uh, in, 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 in particular to the fact that the heralding efficiency of the photon source is not one, but it's only 25%. So this means that condition on herald, we have only 0 0.25 uh, photon arriving in front of the memory. And this is the main reason why we have a, we have a, a, a low concurrence. But I want to stress here that actually this vacuum term in a, in a repeater architecture um, would not affect the final fidelity of the measurement, but it would only affect the rate because this we would actually purify this, this vacuum by, by doing some post-selection at the end of the repeat. And so to, to assess what kind of fidelities we could reach without this vacuum, we can, we can define an effective fidelity where we artificially put to zero the vacuum term and we see that we have uh, you know, um, a fidelity of around 92%, which is actually uh, quite, quite good. The other thing that I want to emphasize is that the heralding rate here is actually quite large for this kind of experiments, it's around 1.4 kilohertz. It's actually the largest um, uh, heralding rate for this kind of experiment entangling two, um, and two memories with, with long-lived storage time, let's say, uh, more than a microsecond at least. And we can in principle even go much larger. Here we were limited by the fact that um, we, our pump power was, was very limited. Um, but if we could increase the pump power in our, in our pump lasers, um, you know, we have computed here, this is a simulation now, we have computed uh, the concurrence as a function of heralding rate. Of course, if you, if you pump large, if you pump stronger, you will have your, your co cross correlation will decrease uh, uh, and, and your visibility will decrease and you will increase your P11, but still you can keep, and so the concurrence at the end will decrease, but still you can keep positive concurrence until in principle, uh, um, maximum heralding rate of 27 kilohertz, um, which would mean that the average time between su two successful events in that case will be 37 microseconds. And this is computed now you know, with the current memory sources and, and link performances, and it could even be better if we increase, for example, this, this heralding um, efficiency. And so the current experiment is actually here, so we, we can in principle still increase a lot there. The heralding rate. One another thing that we need to do, uh, of course, if we want to distribute now entanglement over long distance, is to increase the storage time. Because as I said before, uh, the storage time has to be at least longer than the communication time. So here we we measured again the concurrence uh, and the visibility and the HC, uh, the function of storage time in the excited state. Now we are we are working in the excited state. And we have been able to measure a positive concurrence uh, um, up to 25 microseconds, which would correspond to a separation uh, of five kilometers in principle between the nodes. And now if we want to go much longer, at least in this, in this material, uh, then we should go to, to, in principle, to spin wave. Um, but this in principle is, 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 is possible. We can go to, to, to spin wave storage. And, and uh, if we improve a bit the noise, then, then we, could, we could do this. And then the, the last point I want to say about, about that experiment is that um, we, we take advantage of the fact that it's, that it's temporarily uh, multimode. And, and for this, uh, um, uh, the, way, the way we can, uh, uh, we can measure this is actually to, um, you know, we, we will simulate to have two memories distance by, by, by five kilometers, which means that in that case, the communication time would be 25 microseconds. Um, and so then we will, we will kind of um, split our data in, in trunks of 25 microsecond uh, storage time. So if we had a single mode memory, we could do only one trial during this 25 microseconds. So then this will be this, 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 this point uh, uh, here in this curve. If we have all the modes that we have in our memories, in that case, in our case, we have 62 modes, then we can try 62 times during this, this 25 microseconds. And this, at the end, will in increase the herald heralding rate a lot. So we, what we plot here is the concurrence together with the heralding rate as a function of the number of modes that you consider. And we see that the concurrence is you know, more or less constant, and the heralding rate is increasing uh, linearly uh, with the number of modes. So this is really, it shows really the advantage of having now this, this multi-mode memory, because if you, if you had a memory that was only a single mode over these five kilometers of optical fibers, at least, you would only be able to, to, to have a heralding rate of a few tens of hertz, while 
uh, with, uh, with our multiple memories, you could go to around 800 hertz. Okay, so this is now time multiplexing, what I showed up to now, but in principle, we can also use, as I mentioned earlier, other type of multiplexing. Uh, so for example, uh, we could use frequency multiplexing. So the idea now is that, uh, a reminder that we have this filter up to now that, that you know, uh, select a single spectral mode, but we can also remove this filter and then take the full spectrum of the photon. But if we do that, we also need actually to generate not only one uh, atomic frequency comb at one frequency, but many different atomic frequency combs at, at different frequency. So now we have also 15 quantum memories at different frequencies in our, in our, in our crystal. And uh, we do that actually in an in integrated waveguide quantum memories uh, uh, made with uh, laser, fantastic on laser writing. And so we do the same experiment that I, I, I showed you at the beginning. We have a, a, a photon, idler photon, we have a heralding, and then we store the photon, this, this signal photon into, into the memory. And what we see here is that in red, you have the spectrum of the single photon from the SPDC source. Um, and in, in orange, you have the, 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 the stored and retrieved photon in the memory. And this is the case now where we have a single mode, single frequency mode memory. Now it is the case where we have you know, 15 uh, frequency modes. Um, and now we can see that you can really, in principle, store the full spectrum of, of the photon. And so we have been able to store uh, 15 frequency modes together actually in that experiment with nine temporal modes. In principle, we could also do, uh, do better. So, but in, in total for that experiment, it was 135 modes that we could already store in, 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 that, in that memory. So now, if we actually were able to, um, to separate uh, in frequency all these modes uh, in, in the idler, in the idler um, um, photon, then we could use that for, for doing uh, multiplexing also in a repeater architecture. So if we dream now a little bit, you know, see what, what kind of, how, how many modes we could store in this small crystal, you know, two millimeter by, by five, millimeter, five millimeter by two millimeter. Um, let's say 20 temporal modes, uh, it's, uh, I think it's something that we can easily do. We did actually more, but let's say if you want to keep very high efficiency, let's, let's say we can take 20 temporal modes. 20 frequency modes is I think really uh, principle doable as well. In 100 spatial modes, so, this could be actually it's a 10 by 10 arrays of memories. So this, if we use waveguides, for example, we could imagine easily to go to a 10 by 10 arrays. Now, if you, if you multiply all of these modes, you know, you would have something like 40,000 modes already. And so these are a lot of modes uh, which are stored. So this would actually boost um, uh, the entangling rates of, of an elementary link by, by this kind of, of, of distance of 40,000 modes. If you, at least if you go to, 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 to long distance. So, you know, this will require still, I guess, lots of engineering to go there, uh, but I'm confident that, if, that we can in principle have a large number of modes in these memories and that we can really use that to, 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 to create a practical quantum repeater then over long distance. Um, on the other hand, uh, this does not prevent us to also look uh, a bit further what we could do even better uh, because so up to now I used, um, you know, um, probabilistic sources and we could try to see what we could do if we use not probabilistic sources, but more deterministic sources, on-demand sources of, of, of single photons or, or photon pairs. And this is what I will tell you now how we can do that um, in, in, uh, in the, with Rydberg atoms in the last 10 minutes or so of, 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 of my talk. So um, the problem uh, of having probabilistic uh, sources, as as I, as I mentioned before, um, you, you generate this kind of two mode squeeze state with probabilistic sources with SPDC or also with with DLCZ architecture, and then um, as I showed before, the the cross correlation um, between the between the two photons would uh, you know decay uh, as one over p, where p is the, the creation probability. And so this means also that the fidelity of the entanglements will then also decay as you increase uh, uh, your, your creation probability as, as we also saw, saw before. 
So we have this inherent trade-off now between fidelity of the entanglement and the efficiency with which you can create this, this entanglement. Um, there is one way out of this, and, and this way out is could be to use uh, could be to use deterministic uh, photon photon uh, single photon sources, and so then we could use a repeater architecture which is uh, similar to the one that we used before, but in that instead which uses instead of photon pair sources which uses single photon sources. Now here in H mod we have a single photon source. Uh, and we, we emit a single photon and then we have a bin splitter and part of this single photon will be stored in the memory and some other part will be transmitted now uh, in the optical fibers to go to the central location and have a click. So in that case, the conditional state will be with some probability you have vacuum because it could be that the two photons have been transmitted here and so you have nothing stored in the memory. But you can also have with a, with a probability alpha square, you can also have now uh, this entangled state that, that, that you want, no? where you have one uh, photon here and no here and, and the other way uh, around. So this is again an entangled state of the, of the two memories. And again, this, this, this vacuum mode can be um, um, purified at the end um, by, by post-selection at the end of the, of the repeater chain. So what we need to have now is um, to have an on-demand um, Photon, photon, single photon source, which is compatible in wavelength and spectrum with the quantum memory um, and which generates indistinguishable photons. And this is actually a, a quite hard problems. And, and there are several options that you can use to, to, to solve these problems. Uh, we have seen yeah, before, you can, you can generate single photons very well with, with color centers in diamond or with trap ions. In that case, you don't, re, you don't have a, a, a multimode memory directly available uh, at, at the wavelength of, of, of this, uh, um, uh, of this um, single emitters. So you will need to do frequency conversion. We could also in principle use quantum dots, uh, which can be tuned to some extent, but then the, the spectrum is, is quite large and it's hard, actually hard to find a memory which is well, well suited for this. And there are other options, which I would call you know, naturally resonant single photon sources, where you will use the same species for the single photon and for the ensemble based memory. This could be single trap atoms, for example, as is done in, in, in Rempe's group at MPQ, um, or a, a single uh, rare earth ions, which is also done actually at MPQ and also in our, in our lab, for example. But what I want to tell you today is another uh, way that we could do this, keeping the, the ensemble approach. And this is now using single uh, Rydberg excitation in the atomic cloud. So what is a Rydberg atom? Um, a Rydberg atom is an atom excited to a very high level, uh, high principal quantum number n. And um, if you increase uh, an atom to, to a Rydberg state, then it will have very high uh, dipole moment between, uh, between neighboring states, and adjacent states, which will scale as n square, where, where, uh, where n is the, the principal quantum number. And now if you take two of these atoms and you put them uh, close together, they will strongly interact via Van der Waals interaction. And if you put them close enough, um, the interaction will prevent uh, the excitation of, of two of these ions in, in, in the Rydberg state, two of these atoms in the Rydberg state. This is what we call Rydberg uh, blockade. And so if you now have an ensemble of atoms and you have a collection of atoms, but in the radius, of this uh, blockade sphere, radius um, Rb, um, you could, in principle, only uh, excite only one uh, atom in, within this, 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 this radius. So if you have an ensemble which is small enough, you could, in principle, have only one excitation inside, inside this, um, this, this sample. And so you would have, again, a, Rydberg, a collective excitation, but now with a Rydberg state, um, uh, such that, um, yeah, in principle, you can, you can create on only one. So this is um, our setup, uh, how we can, how we can um, generate that in the lab. We have laser cooled 87 rubidium uh, atoms uh, that we, we trap in a dipole trap, a small dipole trap. Um, and, and then we excite them um, to Rydberg level n equal 90, which where we have a, a Rydberg blockade radius of around 13 uh, micrometer. And then this, this probe size here uh, is, is around 6.5 micrometers. So we have in principle 
a single uh, longitudinal, uh, um, single sphere in a longitudinal mode, let's say, or a single mode approximation. And then we can try to generate photons. So this has been actually not only done by us, but by, by many people uh, already in the past, uh, pioneered by, 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 uh, by Vuletic, uh, Kutzmich, uh, Adams, and, and, and all, these, all these people here. Um, so what we do is that we do an off-resonant excitation. So we have a probe laser and, and a coupling laser that we generate off to, to excite off resonantly to the Rydberg states. And we generate a Rydberg excitation, can store it for a while, and then we retrieve it. And then we have a single photon uh, at the output. So we see here a temporal profile of this. So this would be the, uh, um, uh, the weak probe that we have at the beginning. And the control pulse now is switched off during this period here. And then we, we have the, the single photon coming out at, 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 the, at the output here when we switch on the control pulse again. And now we can do a Hanbury run and twist measurement to see that it's really a single photon. So we take this single photon, we put it into a bin splitter, and we look at the coincidences between these two detectors, and we measure an autocorrelation function. And we see that actually it's, it's much, much, much smaller than one. It's around between 0 0.2 and 0 0.3 in our case. And we can plot this due to the function of the probability to generate a photon, which in our case is around 10, between 10 and can be up to up to 20%, I would say. Um, so we see that we keep with a single photon over all the, all the range of, of probabilities. So the single photon is good. It's not, uh, it's not um, extremely impressive in terms of G2. Uh, but I want to, to emphasize that there are some other experiments done in this group. Uh, by uh, Wolstone and Porto, where they have been able to actually observe uh, a G2, uh, a, photo, a Rydberg photon with a G2 of 10 to minus 3 to 10 to minus 4, which is very impressive. And they did that by exciting to actually a very much higher Rydberg level of 240. But in principle, it's possible to have actually very good single photons from, from these samples. So now something else that we need to, to, to do is to show that we need indistinguishable single photons if we want to make a be able to make a bell state measurement between two distant nodes at some point. And so for this, what we did, uh, we did the hongo mandel experiment, uh, where we combine a weak coherent state uh, with a single photon at the bin splitter, and we look at the hongo mandel interference. And so um, basically, uh, then uh, what, we, what we have, we can measure a hongo mandel with a given visibility, and we can calculate then the expected visibility that we expect from the fact that we have not two single photons, but a weak coherent state and an imperfect single photon. And the difference between the measured value and these expected values will, will give us actually the indistinguishability uh, of, of our Wittberg photon with a weak coherent state. And what we plot here is the indistinguishability as a function of the detection window. And we see that when we have a detection window of 500 nanosecond, which takes the full photon, and, and then we, we basically have 90% indistinguishability. And when we take a smaller window, we can go up to 99, 98, 99%. And so this means that our photons are mostly indistinguishable. And we think that most of the indistinguishability that, we, that remains here is actually due to the line width of the weak coherent state that we, that we use. OK, and now, now we, we are still, we are able to generate a single photon. Let's see if we can really, if this photon is really memory compatible. So what we will do? is that we generate a single photon, we put it into an optical fiber, and we will store it now into another atomic ensemble where we have a quantum memory in this atomic ensemble. And this quantum memory is a Raman uh, quantum memory. So when the single photon arrives, uh, we have a control pulse of resonant control pulse now that will map now the single photon at the spin excitation now into, into this, this S state. And we can store it for a while and then we read it, read it out with another control pulse, and, and the single photon will be uh, will be emitted. And this is what we are actually doing uh, right now in the lab. These are uh, pre preliminary data. So what we see here is a temporal profile uh, as a function of time um, of uh, the single uh, photon generated by our Wittberg ensemble. And now, uh, when we uh, store it into the Raman memory, we can see that we have some, still some part which is transmitted. But we have some part which is now stored and retrieved in, in, in the Raman memory. So we can actually um, um, store and retrieve this photon with a total efficiency of about um, 22%. Uh, um, and with more importantly, with a signal to noise ratio uh, around 15. So actually, the signal to noise ratio is very good, even though at the end we don't have so many photons at, at the input because we have 
a lot of loss in our in our in our setup. You have about you know 0 0.02 photon at the inputs of, of our atomic ensemble. But nevertheless, we can still retrieve it with a very high uh, signal to noise ratio. So this is on, ongoing work, and, uh, and um, yeah, there will be more results about this. Okay, so let me now um, arrive to the to the conclusion. Um, so I showed you that you know we can do nice, very nice things with with solid state uh, rare earth based quantum memories. They are really excellent multi mode quantum memories. We have shown that we can um, perform heralded entanglements between. Uh, and between remote uh, crystals. Uh, in our case, they were 10 meters uh, away, but our scheme is, is really extendable to longer distances. Uh, although for this, we most probably need to improve the performances in terms of efficiency, in terms of storage time, and in terms of larger of mo number of modes. But this is really one of our goals to, to go towards large scale inventory uh, networks. And then I also showed you that you know, using read back states and, and cold atomic ensembles, we can in principle uh, um, uh, generate a single photon deterministically, which are indistinguishable and which are also compatible with, with a quantum memory. And I have shown you a first uh, experiment where we can store now one of these Rydberg photons into an atomic uh, memory. So where, where do we go from, from, from here? Um, so for a long time, actually, I had, I had, this, uh, I had this as an outlook in my, in, in my talk. Uh, that we wanted to do this, this experiment. So now actually we, we have done this experiment. So we have to look at the further steps towards a quantum repeater. So one, one first step is really to try to go towards long distance, uh, including outside the lab. We want to make a demonstration also outside, outside the lab uh, over tens, tens of kilometers. Um, and then what we would like to do is also to make a, um, a, fun a functional, what we call a functional quantum repeater link. And the idea is that you know this kind of number state entanglement is not super well suited for for doing uh, um, uh, QKD, for example. Um, so what DLCZ have proposed is actually to have two chains of this entangled state, uh, and then to create at the end a maximally entangled state between this memory A and, and B prime plus uh, A prime B, for example. Uh, and this is something that we also um, want to do uh, in the future, and we think we can we can do it. And also something we think we can do it is um, uh, to, to perform our entanglement swapping between two repeater links, which is, this still has never been done uh, with, with, with um, any system as far as I know. Um, so yeah, it's actually this, you know, making a quantum repeater is actually harder than we thought uh, 10 years ago, but I think now we, we have laid really the, the essential foundations and we are closer to, 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 to make a quantum repeater with, with, with the resources that, uh, that we have. Okay, let me uh, finish now and thanks um, my group. Uh, this is a very old picture, actually. It's been a while since we haven't been able to take a picture that close you know, without masks. I uh, hope we can do that soon again. And actually some people uh, here, which are now at MPQ, you now Pau and, and, and Emanuele, for example, at our postdocs in, in Gerhard Rempe's group. And yeah, I want to thank all, all the people in my group and um, all the funders as well. And also thank you for, for your attention. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Derek Martin, for your nice talk.